Facebook. This is Albert. Uh, we're on Facebook Live right now. Just wanted to welcome you to Triple Your Job Offers with Albert Chen. Uh, we're going to be going through the first half of this conversation today on Facebook, and I just want you to follow along. Uh, behind me is, well, Albert's list, but you'll see my presentation as well. And so I hope you sit back, enjoy the show, and uh, furthermore, if you've got any questions, I'll answer them in the comments later on. And uh, we'll also probably have a presentation deck later, so. Yeah, we're going to talk about everything today from resumes and cover letters to personal branding to networking events and what it means to network. And a lot of it is going to be tied back into my own personal story and how I've come through this journey and how, you can, how you've joined me on this journey too because no singular individual job search happens just on one person alone. It happens with the work and the collaboration of a lot of other people. And so, uh, yeah, sit back, enjoy. A lot of the people are filing in now, and we will get started shortly. I'll see you guys on the other side. Okay, so please help me welcome Albert. So, uh, welcome everyone tonight to How to Triple Your Job Offers. And I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. I see definitely a lot of new faces, too. And over the next 90 minutes, I just want to have a conversation about how to find a job, right? And we all know this is Silicon Valley. We all know that it's hyped and really, really growing right now. And it's all about how to stand out among all these different applicants that are vying for the same role as you. And for this presentation tonight, I not only want to cover a lot of relevant topics and relevant strategies that you can take away, I also want to share a little bit about my story because as amazing as Cheryl likes to paint me out up there, I'm one of you. Uh, I have been laid off three times in six years, just to put that out there. I graduated from college with a GPA of less than 3.5, uh, and I have, uh, I have the same things every day when it comes to questioning whether I like my job, how I'm interacting with my colleagues, did I wear that dress shirt correctly to that networking event? Any of you ask these questions on a day-to-day -day basis when you go out and network and figure it out? I guess you're all perfect then, so I'm the one trying to prove my worth to you tonight. <laughs> so uh, we're going to cover a wide range of topics over the next 90 minutes that include everything that we have here. Setting the right intentions, uh, writing resumes and cover letters, building your personal brand, networking and relationship building, job boards and communities, mastering the interview, putting it all together, and then we'll have a couple of questions. And in between all of this, we're gonna have a little bit of story time too, because I think that it's important that when we look through our job search, it's not just finding a job at the end of the day. It's also a very, very human experience, right? Have, have any of you gone through the job experience and been rejected from a job, been fired from a job, been laid off from a job? It's okay to raise your hand because you know what? It's it's all about being vulnerable, and I want to create that environment and that space tonight where we can have that conversation openly and no one will judge you. Uh, because I've gone through it so many times myself that I'm willing to just put it out there because it is what it is. And so we'll get started with that tonight. So a little bit about me first off. Uh, who am I exactly? I am the founder of Albert's List, but I do have a day job. And I work at a company called Proficient, or a technology consulting firm. And I'm a marketing manager there working on our cloud and DevOps partnerships uh, with companies like IBM, uh, Dell, Amazon Web Services, and I do a lot of content marketing every single day. So I'm writing every single day, I'm working on strategy, and I'm figuring out how we can sell more of our products to large Fortune 500 and Global 2000 brands. So when I'm not doing that, I am working on Albert's List. And so what is Albert's List? Um, besides this Facebook group. The greater idea is that it is a, a social network and it is a marketplace that brings people like all of you together and connects you with the recruiters that can get you into companies like eBay, GoPro, Cisco, and have those conversations at an accelerated rate. The story I often tell is, you know, sometimes you walk into work and maybe, you know, one of you will walk into work tomorrow morning and your boss is gonna call you in and they're gonna say, sorry, but your services are no longer needed. And when, when that happens, and that's happened to me before, multiple times now, um, the, first, the first idea that go, is to go home and cry into your pillow, drink yourself silly, maybe, maybe go and spend some money on some comfort food because you really don't know what to do at that point. Our jobs are such a big part of our daily livelihood and our habits that when we get that rip from the seams of our 
just daily life, it makes us feel like we're just inadequate. And the greater vision for Albert's List is to have you, help you have that more offensive-minded approach. That you can come into this group, and we've built a great culture, and you can feel like you're welcome. You can feel like it's okay to say, I just got fired from my job, because you're gonna have 10, 15 people saying, you know, you're gonna get back on your feet soon. And one job is just one job, it's gonna be okay. And that's what we try to, that's what we try to do every day with them. And so we've had people who have gotten jobs, we've had people who've met at networking events, and people who talk about this group in ways that I never thought I'd imagine, too. Because when I started this group three years ago, I just wanted to dump job opportunities. <laughs> Building it into a business was never, ever, ever my goal for this. And so, besides that, I also wrote a recent, I recently wrote a book uh, that you can find on Amazon and Amazon Kindle called The New Graduate's Guide to Finding a Marketing Job in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it's an Amazon bestseller, and one of the other aspects of it is that even though it says new grad in the title, it's relevant for anyone who wants to look for a job. And it's relevant for anyone who wants to find new networking events, find new networking strategies, and really get the most out of their job hunt. Because I know that uh, for a lot of us, a job hunt is kind of a lot of poking around, it's a lot of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. And in my eyes, it's kind of that way, but it doesn't have to be. It can be a lot better than that. So uh, before we jump into the, all the really nitty gritty applicable stuff, and I know some of you will have questions, I want to set some intentions for the evening because I think it's important that whenever you get into a job search, into a job hunt, you have to be able to be in that right mindset. You have to be ready for the entire journey ahead because it's not just something where you go down to the grocery store, buy a loaf of bread, and then go home. This is something where you're literally getting yourself up every single day, figuring out what you're gonna be doing for that day, and then really getting in that mindset to just go ahead and crush it. So, as we go through this entire experience, I wanna take you through a little bit of intention setting. Is that okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, the first intention that I wanna set for tonight that finding work is an inevitable outcome. I know I have this fear too, and tell me, raise your hand if you share it, that when you're jobless, you feel like maybe you're never ever gonna get a job again. So, right, we all feel that a little bit. And that mindset is the worst mindset to have because if you get into that, you're gonna go down into a spiral really, really quickly. And so, tonight I have an invitation for you all with regards to this mindset, and that is that you're gonna get a job no matter what. If you've been unemployed for the last six months, for the last year, or you're just starting out on your job hunt, or you're in a job that you absolutely hate, no matter what, you're gonna get a job. And there's just no way, other way around it. You can't afford to think differently. So are we all good on setting this intention tonight? Fantastic. The second intention I'd like to set tonight is that it's okay to ask for help. I know I have problems asking for help, and I know I have problems reaching out because sometimes it's an issue of pride and it's an issue of ego. When I was the last unemployed in January of this year, I decided to throw that all aside because it's not worth stewing in your own misery and it's not worth sitting in an area of despair and darkness. I think people in your life want you to be happy and people who are connected to you in life want you to be happy as well. And the more they know about what's going on with you, and the more that, and the more the, of one thing that I've discovered is that people want you to be happy and they want to be able to step up for the occasion to help you. So if something that you've never done in your job search or in your career or really in anything is to ask for help and to say, hey, I'm looking for a job. Can anyone offer me any leads, connections, advice? I'm looking for the following things. That's the perfect way to start. I went a little bit more flowery, of course, but being able to ask for help is the first step to getting the help you need. Otherwise, you're gonna be stuck, stuck in your own circle. The third intention I wanna to set tonight is that it's okay to find a job for the sake of finding a job. How many of you here have heard um, love what you do and do what you love and have put yourself in all of those, I guess, passionate memes that you see on Facebook or listen to Steve Jobs' 2005 commencement speech at Stanford so many times? <laughs> right, we all have. And we get into this pressure, right, about how we need to find something that we absolutely love to do, and if we don't find what we absolutely love to do, then life is over. 
And I want to dispel that myth tonight because Silicon Valley is an expensive place to live. Right? I know we have $4,000 three bedroom apartments here. It's ridiculous. Toast costs $7 in San Francisco, right? And, and if you're going to like sacrifice yourself for $7 toast and not be able to pay for your bills, then that's on you. And your first and foremost job, I think, is to survive. If you find a job that you absolutely love and adore and can't wait to jump out of bed for every morning, then you know that's 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 a great thing too. But if you're one of the few one of the many people in this world who want to have a job because you have an instrument you love to play or you enjoy traveling or you enjoy knitting or you enjoy working on your house on the weekend, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And for those of you who are in this crowd who may be afraid to speak up and say that you want a job just for the sake of having a job, I want you to know that it's okay. Are we good with that? Great. And finally, it's okay to be vulnerable about your search. I know I mentioned this a little earlier. And I wanted to just say that uh, you know, it's, it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to say I'm struggling. Because when you put that out there, it creates space for people to ask and see how you're doing at the end of the day. And this vulnerability is something that I know also is huge in Silicon Valley these days because every single startup founder, startup leader swears by it because it brings conversations forward. And if there's one thing that's true, that's true. Um, and so it's okay to ask for that help. It's okay to say that you know, I've gone through 20 interviews in the last five months and I still haven't gotten anything and I keep getting rejected. And what am I gonna do? And that's something that's okay to talk about. So that said, you know, with all the things that we're setting intentions for, it's time to get to work. So we're gonna throw the kitchen sink at our job search today because that's exactly how it has to work. And so the one last intention or even just statement I wanna make is that we're gonna do what we can today to help set in your mind that in order to get where you wanna go with that new job, you're gonna to have to take journeys into directions that you've never been to get results that you might not have ever seen. And it's gonna be a lot of different things coming at once and we're hopefully gonna stick this in the next hour. And so, let's get started. So the first section that I, I wanna talk about today is resumes and cover letters. And so these are, this is pretty standard fare when it comes to uh, talking about who you are and what you're looking for. And like I said at the top of this presentation, I wanted to start this with a story. And so this story comes around in January of this year. I'm on my, I'm on my most recent job search and I find myself at a startup in San Diego. I'm on the 21st floor and to my right, is the beautiful Pacific Ocean and the Mexican border too and everything. And it's a really beautiful day out as it is in San Diego. And at this startup, I'm standing across, sitting across from the CEO and the CEO. And they look at my resume, which you'll see here in a couple minutes, and they notice that I've worked at a lot of places in the last five years or so. And they ask me, like, what's going on here? What have you learned? What have you discovered? And why do you want to work here specifically? And in, I think, every single, uh, every single way that people ask you about your resume, they want to hear, I want to work here because I'm qualified for X, Y, and Z. And I have these skills, and I have this background, and I can do all these things. And in this, in this sense, I decided to take a different route. I decided to tell a little bit of a story. I know, and everyone else should know when they now interview me, that. I have a history of layoffs. They've gotten better year by year, obviously. I was laid off from my first job because I hated my boss and she hated me, and so we just got laid off. At my last job, <laughs> at my last job I got laid off because of budget. So we're getting better, right? And in, my, in the middle layoff that I had, I just, my mind just wasn't there for, I think, four of the six months. I was focusing on other parts of my life and eventually they disliked me too. And that actually happened to be my alumni association at the school I graduated from. That's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty big soul crusher there, if you let it become one. And so I looked the CEO and the COO in the eyes and I said, you know, I, I, I've gone through a lot of interesting journeys over the last couple of years. And I have, yes, been laid off quite a few times. But in the jobs that I've taken over the last couple of years, uh, I have found myself 
really passionate about what I do because I get to do the following things. And because I've also learned from these previous jobs of how I exist within the company. And I also am here today because I understand that these strengths that I love are now going to benefit your company. And, and, and going by that story ultimately helped me get an offer, which I didn't take, but it showed that my resume was no more than just a resume, but rather a story that was able to look at what I had done in my past. And that story helped me boost me into the future, is I guess what you could say. So now let's jump into the nitty gritty technical aspects. What the heck is your resume? Your resume is a catalog of all the jobs that you've ever held and the capabilities that you carry. It's a taste of who you are, but not the main course, right? So when it comes to your resume, it's important for you to give away a little bit of who you are, but not give away the whole farm because that's what the interview is for. And it's a foot in the door, but no guarantee of a job. However, it's like selling yourself and it's that piece of sales collateral that gets you in the door, that gets people interested, and ultimately you have to continue the conversation. And finally, as I just explained in my story, it's an evolution of who you have been and how you have grown over the years. And so when they have job listings online that say that you have advanced over year over year and it shows advancement, that's what they're talking about. The basic resume, and we'll see a couple of resumes here in a moment that I have, uh, one in 2006 and one as of earlier this year, is that it has several key areas that contribute to the building of your profile. It has your career highlights and summary, your education and certificates, and it looks at your job duties and action verbs. So you're not just sitting there saying, oh, I helped the company save that much money, but it's more like I led something that helped the company save that much money. Or I created a marketing campaign that led to this much. Or um, I, uh, I engineered something and was able to help the company take it to market based on my technical capabilities and ultimately drive sales. And the sales aspect is something we'll actually talk about a little bit later on within the presentation as to how you'll interview. So that's a little bit of a uh, coming attraction. Um, so this uh, gem that you see behind me here is my first ever resume, circa August 2006. And I guess I wanted to share this resume with you today because I wanted to really visualize what it meant to grow and what it meant to write, well, a not so good resume because this is my first resume ever. And I guess I'll go to my next slide. This is the resume that I have as of January this year. And I guess I'll go ahead and point out the elements and the pieces of it that should matter. And this is kind of how I look at resumes that have gotten me through the door. And we'll talk about applicant tracking systems in a moment. So in, my, in every resume that I build, it's got the name and everything when it comes to uh, social media, email, address, things like that. Um, then I like to follow with highlights, as I mentioned earlier, and feel free to take photos. And I'll also have this, I think, available later. Uh, and the highlights aspect is important because it shows in a really short sense what you've been able to create, what you've been able to do, and what it looks like when you do it. Then the next section I like to go in is technical skills, or skills in general. Um, just a quick survey of the room, are we all like, born and bred Silicon Valley people in here, are you all like at tech companies? Who's not at a tech company? Okay, so there's a few of you here too. Um, or who doesn't like work in, like even adjacent to a tech company, like you're marketing at Cisco or something. Um, okay, so so I guess we have a mix of a little bit of both here, but, oh. but uh, with regards to um, this section, this section is technical skills, skills that include what you're capable of doing. And it's usually put out in a list because it gives you the opportunity to get through the applicant tracking system and helps you see what kind of skills that you're capable of doing so they don't have to comb through the rest of the meat of your resume. Uh, so the rest of my resume pretty much looks like this. It's got a uh, role, title, um, title of the role, and then time I was there, whether I was a contractor or not. We all know that contracting is part of the course in the Bay Area, and that's just how my life was when I first started out here. And then it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of verbs at the beginning: managed, collaborated, managed, led, audited, gathered. And so, with regards to your resume, it's all about how you use your action verbs. 
Um, I've read resumes that just say um, 50 plus WebEx social communities, for example. And they don't really say much more than that, right? Your resume has to tell a story of what you did and what you were able to accomplish and how you're able to take that to the next level. Um, and then in specific areas of my resume, I have a freelance section here. This is usually billed as other experience. And then there's an area for education and uh, any certifications that you're going for as well. So compared to what you see here and compared to what you see there, it's literally night and day. And of course, you know, you go through a lot in 10 years, but it's kind of the same idea as you go along. So that's kind of how it looks when it comes to resume stuff. Um, the next section, which I was talking about a little bit earlier, was the applicant tracking system. So the applicant tracking system is something that came into vogue after the 2009 recession. Uh, the 2009 recession meant that a lot of companies were getting a lot of resumes at once, and it was really forcing companies to think of ways to filter people out, because companies, they want to hire people, but they want to hire the right amount so that it doesn't kill their bottom line. Uh, and so one area that is of importance when it comes to writing your resume is gaming the applicant tracking system until they probably come up with something else. And the way that you game it is you figure out what title of a role you're looking at, you figure out what skills you have, and you write your resume to basically that job description so that you can at least get a phone screen. So if you take a look at my resume, it gets through a lot of applicant tracking systems because you have a lot of companies that look for things like, say, your HTML, CSS or your SQL, or your ability to speak Chinese, or any of these skills up here under analytics and social media platforms. Because you have a lot of companies who look for this kind of thing specifically, list by list. Um, and then the other aspect is, uh, is, your, is your title. So as a product marketing manager, even though I might not have been product marketing my entire life, I list product marketing, product marketing, and you know I look at like other product marketing aspects here. Uh, this is before I changed my resume, but it's basically product marketing all the way through. Um, because a lot of roles are very malleable in some sense. Um, if you do, in the marketing space at least, if you do work on a social media platform, if you're trying to drive awareness, trying to drive sales, and there's a product involved, you're a product marketing, even product marketing person, even though you might be a Twitter specialist at the end of the day. So there's always a way to make yourself look a lot more interesting than maybe you think you are personally. So the, the, the big lesson from this is that depending on where you want to go in your career, set up your resume in a way that will allow you to go towards what you want and use the system to your advantage instead of letting the system hurt you. Um, and the final thing I want to talk about is cover letters. So I know cover letters are like the devil for a lot of us. I personally don't write cover letters. Uh, because I try to find personal connections into companies, and I'm hoping that many of you do too as well. Uh, but for those companies that require cover letters, not all do, and for a lot of recruiters in the Bay Area, they also don't require cover letters. But if you do write them, it's similar to the writing the res writing of a resume in the sense that it's like writing a story, right? You have an introduction, you talk about who you, why you're the best person for the job, and what sets you apart based on previous roles and call to actions and getting in touch. Um, but I think in a world where we're looking for more of that professional high-touch experience, um, a cover letter is probably going out of style, and I hope so too. But I have to talk about it because a lot of uh, career centers will talk about it. Um, so do we break for questions or do we just go on to the next section? Well, I have a question for Albert, so Okay, wait, hold on. Uh, we'll take a couple, maybe? Okay. Yeah, so just a general question about the higher one. Uh, just a general question for you. Yeah. In terms of how you're structuring this um, agenda for today, uh -huh. so are we done with the resume and then moving on to cover letter section? Yes. Okay, yes. so I'm going to ask first. Okay. Cool. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Herbier, um, library board member. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? Yes. See, I told you. I would always get one question about slides. Yes, everyone. Albert has given me permission to uh, give you the slides. He'll do slide deck or slide share, and I'll also email them to you. I have them available. Yes. Oh, you have a question for me specifically. Oh, for him. Okay. 
Uh, hey, uh, with regards to the cover letter, uh -huh. uh, see, uh, I think like uh, the first, uh, the, the resume reaches the recruiters first. Uh, yeah. And uh, for uh, them to understand about our job, uh -huh. cover letter is the only way. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, because like I used to read articles like you know, where cover letter is like supposed to be like sort of it would definitely sort of, if it's really good, it's generally get you, going to get you a phone screen at least or he's going to connect me to the hiring manager. Uh, you say like cover letter is going to go off, right? That, that's really good news if at all it does. Uh, so the way I, I see I, it is yeah. that you have a lot of staffing agencies getting a million resumes per day mm -hmm. and cover letters are like mini essays. Mm -hmm. And so who has time to read 30 different mini essays every day? while trying to call people on job boards, while also trying to read resumes, shuffle resumes out to hiring managers and get it back. It's a very, I mean, I, I don't think it's gonna go away like soon, 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 like next week, but I anticipate it will go out soon and you know, as people try to look for um, you know, different ways to get into companies as so, you know, with personal connections, LinkedIn and things like that. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, I wonder if there are any service that I can use to test if my resume is going to pass applicant tracking system mm -hmm. in some yeah. way. Yeah, so uh, JobScan is a really good one. Uh, and you basically copy your resume and you copy a job description and it will tell you what a percentage match it is. And so I did that actually with my job and I think I got like a 94% match. Yeah, hi. Uh, so yeah. my question is on the resume. So if we, if we have like career breaks, how do we address it in resume? Right. So when you have a career break in your resume, the way that I've often heard of what you do is you talk about what you did during that career break. Uh, because despite the fact that you may not have been being paid by a company, there was another way that you looked to enrich your life or further your skills or, you know, whichever. So I noticed the difference between your two resumes. The first one you started off, you had the objective listed, and it was not included in your second resume. Do you recommend leaving an objective off? And secondly, regarding skills, you have technical skills listed, but you've also mentioned something about soft skills. How do you incorporate that into the resume? Okay, so uh, with regards to the very first resume, this was written when I was just yeah. barely out of 12th grade. Um, this is written <laughs> when I'm like 28. Uh, so, I've gladly changed in 12 years. Um, with regards to the objective statement, I feel like the objective statement is a tad redundant because if you're applying for a job already, that's what your objective is. And so, when it comes to space on your resume, because I'm literally here at the bottom of page two, and I've been barely working for five years, um, the objective statement is, the, it's better to put, at least in my opinion, highlights, uh, because you need to be able to uh, really flesh out what it is that you're capable of doing. Uh, now on the, on, on the object of soft skills, so are you talking about being a team player and doing those kind of things? Yeah. So when I look at that, I feel like those are uh, necessary components that come with you when you go into a job. Because if you think about it, if you are able to, if you tell your employer that you are a, not a, if, you, if, you, if you, I guess if you tell them that you're not a team player and you prefer to work alone, I think a lot of companies in the Valley are gonna say no to you. If you say that you're a really good communicator on your resume, I think that's already a given because you have to be able to communicate in order to get, just get stuff done. And so um, I think a lot of those, uh, those are the extra lines on the job description that you see. Uh, I think that uh, in some sense you don't need to put that on your resume because uh, those are already required aspects of your ability to do a job. Um, uh, um, does mass submitting resumes work and how should you combine quality and quantity in the job search? Yeah, so I have, I generally, I, I do mass submit resumes, I will be the first to admit that. Um, and I do it because uh, in a lot of ways I have a very generic looking resume that does a lot of marketing stuff. Um, and if the resume is looking for a specific set of skills, I'll tailor that resume. But if the resume is looking for product marketing in my experience, I just submit what I have here because it just covers all the basics of what product marketing jobs want. Um, and so I think to ensure quality over quantity, it's important to be able to 
uh, it's important to be able to focus on the quality of the companies and the quality of the industry. So I'm a product marketer, but I hang out in high tech. Uh, there's no way that a resume like this gets into a company that does consumer goods down in Orange County. Uh, Taco Bell will not take this resume. Uh, Taco Bell Corporate, by the way, is in Irvine. So they will never take my resume. Um, uh, what's another company down there? Quicksilver, the surfing company, would never take a resume like this. I would have to redo my resume completely because there's no aspect of the Quicksilver uh, marketing or product line that includes doing B2B marketing that might include um, things like selling software or managing hardware. So when it comes to that, yes, I would have to change my resume, but for like all the tech companies out there, uh, a resume like this is functional because it talks about things like cloud and networking and a lot of high tech stuff that is very applicable on the other side. Okay, uh, Andy, uh, we got one more question. Are you okay with one more question? Are we done like for sure at 8.30? Uh, you can go a little bit longer. Okay. I told Red Robin, our uh, networking uh, palace, that we will be over there at around 8.45. Okay, sounds right? good. So however long you want to go. Okay. Okay, so first shout out to Vector Marketing. I love Cutco. <laughs> Cutco's great. I love their super shares. <laughs> 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 Second, uh, how do you tailor your resume if all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you're like, uh, I, I, I have software engineering experience for the last 10 years, but now I want to be a program manager. And okay. there's nothing in your skill set that's a program manager experience. There's always uh, skills that are transferable. Uh, you've been doing software engineering for the last 10 years. That means you probably know something about software engineering, right? And so I think when it comes to having known that you've built that software, you know the entire standard operating procedure. You probably have an idea of how DevOps works. You probably have an idea of how to like collaborate and how to push software forward, go to market. And so your, uh, your strategy for building out that resume is to look at where you've led in your software, in your software uh, development career. And there's no doubt that you've done that because I'm just gonna guess at some point, maybe year five through year ten, a manager's come to you and said, Hey, look, we're having we're doing this sprint, and I want you to be a critical part of the sprint because we gotta go to market, otherwise our investors are gonna fry us. And I see you're nodding, so that's probably happened. And so that's where your program management experience comes in. Because now you're able to explain and show that even though you've been knee deep coding in whatever code you've been in, that you also stepped out of that code for a couple moments and you're able to look at the higher level picture because somebody's told you to do so. And even if you never had the ability to do that higher level picture of like software engineering as a program manager, uh, you've, you've no doubt paid attention to the industry over the past 10 years because technology moves fast and you gotta pick up those skills, otherwise you wouldn't last 10 years. And so my advice for you would be to see what you look at as the higher, greater picture and then attack it that way based on your ability to be in the trenches and know how it works inside the trenches. Cool. So I guess we'll move on to the next section then, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, the next section I wanna talk about is building your personal brand. This is a favorite of mine because it has been an adventure over the last couple of years of doing this, including building Albert's List and including figuring out how I fit in my own career and hoping that the two don't collide with each other. So uh, this, is, this is my next story. Uh, and this behind me is called The Art of Active Networking. Uh, some of you might have heard of this event, some of you might not have. It's an event that goes on in San Francisco where people of all walks of life um, meet, meet each other and uh, find ways to help each other get better in their career. And this uh, was an event actually about four years back where I met Anthony Lee up there in the corner. And he changed my view on networking and personal branding forever. And I know I don't say that with, and I know I say that with like no hesitancy because it's very true. I remember when I met Anthony for the very first time and I know that all of you probably go to networking events in one capacity or another. And what's the first word, what's the first sentence that comes out of anyone's mouth? What do you do, right? And, and Anthony wasn't that type of person. He, uh, he, he looked at me when I walked up to him after I walked up to a lot of other people, and he asked me what I believed in. And, and for, for a 24-year-old, I just wanted a paycheck. <laughs> I was going to work legitimately almost every week, and I'm ashamed to say this now, but it is what it is, because I wanted to make money so that I could pay rent. 
And it's that moment when I think he woke me up a little bit, that there was a little bit more to this than just going to work every single day. There was a little bit more to that than just you know sitting at your desk and being a drone. Uh, and that's where I think I really got the idea of what it meant to be a personal brand. Because he not only asked me what I believed in, he asked me what I was committed to, and he also asked me what people could count on me for. Right? And these are three incredibly tough questions. It's not even, these are things that you think about both in your career and in your personal life. Like, life. like who's depending on you? What, what do you believe in? And why the heck do you do any of the things that you do? And I remember going home from that networking event that night with his business card, which at the time on it, on the back, asked those very questions. And what he wanted me to do, as he does with everyone that, uh, that he meets, and you should go talk to him after this, is to email the answers to that question afterwards. And that has led to a wonderfully beautiful four-year mentorship that continues to now, where it's a continual development of my personal brand and understanding what the heck a personal brand is. And so in this next section, I want to jump into that and talk about how you can build your own. So what is a personal brand? A personal brand is your message to the world. It's your commitment to the world. It's how you want to change the world, and it's your knowledge of the world. And I know that maybe for a lot of this crowd, this is an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly fluffy slide because we're talking about rainbows and butterflies and world peace and things like that, right? But for some of us, maybe there's a reason why we wake up and do our job every day. I do my job seriously every day because I believe that sales literally picks up the paycheck and that I want to help my salespeople do the best job that they possibly can so that they can keep the company afloat. And it's really exciting that my company makes big deals. It's a really odd, I guess, way to look at it, but that's one of the reasons why I do what I do. And I know that earlier we had this slide about, um, about, the, uh, about the aspect of uh, not having to do a job, being able to do a job for the sake of doing a job. This also fits in because in a lot of ways, Sometimes you can get really good at one skill, and even though you hate that skill, you continue to cultivate it because it continues to help you pay the bills. And that's something that you can personally brand yourself as well on. And so my encouragement and my invitation for you within this slide is to write down these questions for yourself. What is your message to the world? Or what was the message that you'd like to bring to this world? What are you committed to doing that will help bring about whatever little tiny change that can happen? How do you aspire to change the world in your own way? And what is the knowledge that you have that can help set that forward? And so when it comes to building that personal brand and answering these questions, every single personal brand has to be clear. And I've created a nice acronym for this. CLEAR stands for consistent, leading, engaging, adaptive, and real. And so this is something that when you build it out is something that people get to know you for. People Dude, used to look at me too. when I was working as a social media manager, and I called myself the social media dude back in the day. And they would say, okay, yeah, Albert knows a thing or two about social media, and we should go talk to him about how to maximize your capabilities on Twitter. And that's because I had posted about these things over and over again on LinkedIn, Facebook, on my blog, and so forth. And eventually people came to me and they were like, yeah, you know, we need a social media presence, can you help me? And that's the same thing that each and every one of you should have here on your own as well. And so how do you make that personal brand clear? Consistent is easy to start, right? So posting every day to your social media accounts, writing a blog every week, talking to people about what it is that you're interested in and what you're good at. Leading means that you take a leadership point of view, this is the notion of thought leadership, around what it is that you do. So I guess if you apply this now into job hunting, because I've hunted for jobs so many times and I've helped a lot of people, I've become a leader within this space. And I help people get work and I understand and have mastered, at least in my area of the world, the concept of getting an interview and making sure that interview rocks. Engaging. Engaging is how you interact with the outer world. Are you a friendly person? What do you say to other people? Are you approachable? And are you friendly enough so that people can want to listen to you bring you in for speaking events in your industry, or have you come and lead a session, or you can get a job. Adaptive is your ability to adapt to uh, industry trend changes, um, changes within your own circle and your own job, things like that. 
and your ability to look at how the industry transforms or how your own career transforms. So now that I'm no longer a person who works in social media as a skill every single day, I try to position myself as somebody who knows a thing or two about job hunting and a person who knows a thing or three about cloud computing. And then the final one is being real. So what does it mean to be real? So we talked a little bit earlier about being vulnerable, right? Talking about how you can discuss what your struggles are or what you're great at or what you're bad at. Being real comes down to your authentic self. Whether you're out at a museum and learning about your industry, or whether you're at a networking event meeting interesting people, or whether you're looking to just help people in general. For me, it comes down to sharing interesting blog posts that I have about cloud computing from my LinkedIn to my Facebook profile, or every 1,000 members uh, that join Albert's List. So when there's another 225 people who join Albert's List, we'll talk about how, oh, there are 19,000 members now. Come get your next job here or refer somebody. So how do you build that digital brand or brand in general? And so this comes actually to a book I wrote about three years ago called The Social Media Ecosystem. And that social media ecosystem concept applies in pretty much every single aspect of uh, your career as well. And so the gist of that 50 page book was pretty much these four things here. Um, create content, engage with people who engage with your content and engage with your network. Throw in a little bit of luck and throw a little bit of timing and you're there. And that's easier said than done obviously, right? Because it's like, okay, how do you create luck? How do you create timing? And the answer is you don't because you just, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, but what you can do is the things that you can't control. So you can control the way that you create content. You can control the way that you engage with your audience. And content creation means you know, using all the tools that are available to you, right? So um, Antonio here is recording on Facebook Live. You can leverage Facebook Live for your own needs now and broadcast to your own network. Uh, you can use a variety of other apps such as Periscope, YouTube, things like that. Uh, other content includes being able to write your own blog. Everyone here has a LinkedIn, right? So LinkedIn has something called LinkedIn Pulse. And LinkedIn Pulse lets you write about anything professional, or personal if you wish, but professional to really throw your uh, thought leadership out there and have other people see what you're talking about, get more followers, and build that, uh, build that presence. And LinkedIn doesn't hide that notion either. Uh, they actively promote Pulse as that kind of platform. And then your engagement aspect is you know, who's commenting on your stuff. Uh, who you're getting noticed by, and how you're getting noticed by it, and what you're doing with that extra attention. And then I think, in my opinion, once you have enough of that content and have enough of that engagement going on, eventually you get lucky, and eventually you have things that happen in your timing. And we'll actually talk about that in the next section when it comes to networking. Um, so yeah, how do you, where can you build your personal brand, Facebook, your blog, LinkedIn, your business card? and in about an hour when we go out to Red Robin. So for those of you who are indeed coming, now, coming out to network and have some food here in about 50 minutes, uh, the encouragement is to definitely go out and have those conversations that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have and start building your personal brand and start thinking about how you fit in this world on your terms and how you can turn that into your own career change or career shift. Cool. So uh, I think where are we in the interest of time here? Should I just power through it? Yeah, you can. Okay. All right, I think I'm just gonna power through it. <laughs> um, so the next part is networking and relationship building. Networking and relationship building is exactly what it sounds like. We're gonna talk about what it means to get out to all the litany of networking events that we have out in the Bay Area and how to approach the many conversations that you're having. And before I move into my story, I want to tell you that you're extremely lucky with the amount of networking events that you have out here, so if you're not going to any of them, you're really missing out. Because on any given night that there's one networking event in Orange County, there's like 20 of them out here. So it's time to make use of that. So this is a photo that I have behind me of Laguna Beach. Uh, I was jogging on the beach last November, or it might have been October, and I caught this really beautiful sunset. And there's a lot that went into this beautiful sunset that goes back about four years. 
Back in November of 2012, I found myself at a friend's, uh, in Orange County for a friend's wedding. And as I, was, uh, as I was standard to do before I went to that wedding, I also went to a couple networking events in Orange County. I had met some people on Twitter and they were hosting something called Connect OC. And I showed up and I met a couple of people, one of which ended up joining Albert's List when I founded it about five months later. And when I uh, ultimately started the group, again, I had no intention of turning it into anything. But about two years into the group, I was working at HP as a contractor in product marketing. And I was coming to the end of my contract. I was about two months from the end of it. And I was thinking, you know, maybe it's time to find another job because uh, contracts in the Valley are only guaranteed as much as they are. And you have no idea what the heck will happen. So it turns out that luck dawned on me one day in November when this friend that I had met two years ago had a friend that she went to church with who was looking for a uh, product marketing and communications person at Ingram Micro. And this happened in my own group and I went ahead and said, you know what, I'll go ahead and apply for it because why not? And one thing led to another which led to an interview which led to a flight which eventually led me down to Orange County doing this. And that's, the, the lesson from this is partially networking and partially luck and partially timing. Uh, the last two obviously you can't control as we've discussed earlier, but the first two you can. And things just happen in ways that you can never imagine where you can enjoy sunsets like this. Uh, and so I wanna help you create some of your own luck today because I think that we can all learn how to network and I know that we talked a little bit about soft skills at the very top of this presentation, and you all came here to do some soft skill training today, so we can jump into this. So what is networking, right? Networking is building a relationship with others. Networking is business development, and it's adding value for others before adding value for yourself. And so that's why when people ask you what you do for a living as your first question at a networking event, it's not really asking you what you're doing, it's a crutch question because they have no idea what the heck else to ask you. And what it really, what it really is at the end of the day is uh, that, that's better, is to come from value and ask why people are there. That's why my first question at a networking event is no longer uh, what do you do for a living, but rather what brings you here tonight. Because everybody's got a purpose for going to something. Whether they're looking for a new job, whether they're looking to build a new relationship, whether they want to sell you stuff, and your job at a networking event is to kind of sell yourself, but sell yourself indirectly. You're curious in other people so that people can be curious in you. And you know, the first tenet of that is that, tenet of that is that people love to talk and they love to talk about themselves. We've all been on first dates and we all realize that you know, our first dates are where our date talks more, way, way more than we do. And it works the very same way in networking because people want to express themselves. They want to share themselves. And the more that you have them talking, the more they're interested in you because they're actually not saying a thing at all. Um, and so that's where you're interested in others in before they're interested in you. And that's, yeah, it's a basic high level of networking. So what is networking not? Networking is not selling yourself directly. So it's like me walking up to one of you in the room tonight and saying, hi, I'm from Albert's List and I have a $2,500 program to sell you where I can help you get your next job. Are you interested? None of you are going to be interested because I basically went to the money first and I tried to sell you. And most of you aren't interested in being sold to like that. Most of you want to know first what, what I am, maybe what comes with it, and then maybe you eventually like to get, maybe you eventually like to have somebody sell something to you because a lot of you guys are engineers or really analytical and want to know what you're jumping into before you jump into it. Networking is also not about you. It's actually about the other people. Um, much like putting on events like this, a lot of it is about not yeah, being up here to speak, but rather about you here to like learn, gain value hopefully, go home and realize what you can do with your job search in the morning. Uh, and much like networking, it's you going to that event, you learning about what's going on in the industry, and then seeing how you can help other people, and then hopefully you get help back. And not everyone wants to help you back, but in my opinion, a lot of people do. And finally, networking is not, not inauthentic. So you're going there with your own self-identity, you're figuring out what it is that you are and who you are and how you express it to each other. And so that's why 
you go to a networking event and you ask, what brings you here tonight? How can I help you? Uh, is there anyone I can introduce you to that will help you move forward in your career? Things like that where you go up and you help other people will come back to you thankful. So how networking fits in the job hunt. In networking in the job hunt space, it fits you, uh, it fits by getting you through the door. It opens new doors that online job hunting sites do not because people like people that they know, like, and trust. No like and trust is the most important part of any networking scenario and any friendship or relationship scenario because if you know somebody but you don't trust them or you like somebody but you don't know them or you trust somebody but you don't like them or you know any, any, any combination of those that don't make any sense, you're never gonna get into anywhere and there's only so much you can do online via you know a LinkedIn or a Twitter or a Facebook that's like, okay, I've met you, you look like you're cool but I don't really know you so I don't know how much forward we can move. Networking puts you at the table for the conversation. Um, if you think about it right, there's a lot of really, 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 really wealthy people in this country, and not only did they get there through hard work, but they also know the right people. They got in at the right table. And they were able to go to enough networking events, they were able to meet enough people where someone eventually said, hey, I know you. I've seen you here like 15 times before, and I'm doing this thing at this rich person's estate in Atherton next week. You wanna come along? And, and that's, where, that's where things you know, slowly roll and roll up and roll up. In fact, I have a really short story for a guy that I met at a startup event here a couple years ago. And he was a really recent graduate. And he's been able to parlay his networking into like an exclusive VC event up in like Atherton where he's super connected to everyone who means anything in this valley. And so if he can do it, you, know, you all can too. Networking enables to extend your personal brand online to offline. So one of the interesting things that I always go through when I talk about Albert's List is I'll set up a happy hour and then I'll go to this event and people will come up to me like they've known me for the last 15 years. And I look at them and I'm like, who are you? <laughs> and and that's, that's, some, that's a little bit of personal branding at work because it's being able to put yourself out there so much that people can't ignore you anymore. And then in addition to that, it's being able to take your brand offline to a networking event and saying, hey, I know you from online. You tweeted that thing the other day and that really caught my attention and I read it and I really liked it. And people love context because it allows them to have a conversation that they otherwise wouldn't have. And of course, the final stat that I wanna share, and maybe it should have been the first one, is that 90% of jobs are filled for people who go through personal connections. So who's here, who, who here has heard of like a hidden job market? Right, so that's the hidden job market at work. Knowing the right people and having someone come up to you and say, uh, and, we, and we get this in Albert's List all the time actually, where somebody says, we're not gonna have this job go on the market for the, until, for, until like Monday, and it's like Thursday but we're putting it here first because we trust a lot of you and we want you to have first dibs at it so you know what's going on beforehand. And people love people who give off really great first impressions. And so in regards to the general public, it's all about getting in the door and being able to have that job land on your table before anyone else knows about it. And that can be done through networking as well and knowing the right individuals. And in addition, you know, knowing the right people who reach out to you and are like, hey, you know, um, we have this job coming up in our company and it's not quite open yet, but I want you to interview for it because you know you have an opportunity to uh, possibly get this job and I know, like, and trust you. They're not gonna say it that way, but I know, like, and trust you and I wanna actually have you come in first and maybe you get the job without the job ever going public. So where do you network exactly? And I gave some ideas here with, uh, with, with, marketing as an, with marketing as an example. But basically, it's broadly or in depth. So when it comes to your networking, at the end of the day, um, a lot, a lot of, a lot of people, even me at the very start, do a lot of unfocused networking, and that was the beginning of my career. I found myself at a lot of chamber-oriented mixers with like the Chamber of Commerce. I found myself at places, and no dig on them, but network after work. Uh, and I found myself at events where it was about networking to network. Which is great up to a certain extent because, and, and, I, and I believe that it's a good thing because there are people out there who don't know how to network and they show up because they just need to show up. 
And showing up is more than half the battle because a lot of people flake out, especially in Silicon Valley. Uh, and so if you're new to the whole concept of networking, going to a networking like this makes sense, especially if you're thinking, you know, what is my message to the world? What do I want to do for a living? Maybe I'm a new graduate and I have all these different options across my plate and I'm not sure which one to go to, so I'm just gonna go and talk to people and get closer to where I wanna be. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is where my career has gone in the last couple of years. And so this is in-depth uh, network, where you're going to places like associations. So in the marketing world, it's PRSA, which is the Public Relations Society of America, the International Association of Business Communicators, and the American Marketing Association. And so, you go to these events because you meet a specific kind of people, and you can relate to a specific kind of people, and these people are gonna definitely get closer to where you wanna be. Uh, there's also focused meetup groups, so for example, in Southern California, in Orange County, uh, because I do a lot of marketing to the developer space, I go to developer-focused events, things like Tech in Motion by WorkBridge Associates, or even events put on by uh, technology-related companies that bring people together. And then there's events at venues of interest. So, for example, you know, you'll go to San Francisco and some company will be hosting a social at Uber. And maybe you're interested in the social sharing space or the social collaboration space, and so you go to that. Or you go to a place like the Plug and Play Tech Center because you like startups and you want to get into startups and you know that startups are going to be there. And that's your way of getting in as well. And then finally, you have focused Facebook groups. So, uh, these are things that are not so much Albert's List kind of groups, but more so focused on an industry. So going back into marketing, for example, one really good group is social media managers. Um, it's, uh, it's managed by a friend of mine out in Austin, and they have posts in there every day talking about how to build your social media presence, how to build uh, your client base if you're running your own business, and you know things of that sort. And so it should behoove you to not only do your networking online, but do your networking offline as well, where you're gonna find that giant variety of groups and associations. So uh, how do you make networking work? As we've said, uh, it's all about uh, adding, values to, adding value to others because it's not about you. It's about figuring out what other people are doing in the room. It's about adding value to them so that they can add value to you. And so, these things include everything from how can I help you to why are you here tonight to who can I introduce you to. And for those of you here who maybe volunteer at a nonprofit or something on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you realize that you know you go to the you go to these types of events and you provide your energy, you provide your time for people to help other people, and you come out feeling a lot better about yourself. And networking for me is kind of that therapeutic experience where I do that too because I know what I have to offer. Uh, both professionally and with my entrepreneurial aspirations, and it makes everything feel a lot better. Yeah. And then the other aspect is to follow up. Right. Can I give you a plug? This Thursday, Albert's going to be in Burlingame, so um, you might want to go there. A bunch of people are going to be there networking, correct? Yeah, so on Thursday, we have an event at uh, Jericorture in down downtown Burlingame. They're a wedding and bridal makeup shop, and uh, we have decided to partner up with them uh, because they've been generous enough to offer us some space. So if you're looking for free makeup samples, food, networking with recruiters, things like that, we will have that going on from five to eight o'clock. And that is, on our, uh, that is on our Facebook page, and the event is free. So uh, come and uh, yeah, enjoy yourself and maybe dress up if you'd like to. Um, yeah, so the final one is to follow up with others and to engage. And so, how many of you give out your business cards and then never hear back from anyone? Right, so let me be the first one to tell you in this room tonight that we gotta break that chain because that stuff is stupid. Um, you know, it's really, it's really, it's really, and I know I'm guilty of it too from time to time, but it's really, it's really a time waster and an energy suck when people think that going to networking events means that they're gonna throw business cards in the black holes and they never hear anything back. And so as the person who is on the receiving end of that black hole, it's time to stop that black hole and follow up. And following up from a networking event is fairly easy. You remember what you said with the person and you say something along the lines of, hello, so-and-so, it was great to meet you at this networking event the other day. Uh, I enjoyed hearing about whatever topic we spoke about at that event 
and was wondering if you'd like to have a follow-up conversation over coffee, over the phone, over lunch, over dinner. Um, let me know and I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, your name. So that's an easy model to do it because it's, uh, it gives people an out, it allows people to be acknowledged for something that they've done. Uh, because there's not a lot, lot of not not a lot of like acknowledging in Silicon Valley these days, unless you're making millions, and it uh, it tells somebody that they're valued professionally, and so um, yeah, follow up because it's going to make the world better for everybody. Okay. So job boards and communities is the next section, and I think we're going to just go ahead and skip since we have 15 minutes left. Um, and so job boards and communities is the next aspect uh, of the kitchen sink that we're throwing at, the, uh, at our job searches today. Albert, you can go a little bit longer if you want, as long as people are willing to stay. Okay. I'm not boring anyone yet, am I? <laughs> hopefully, I? Hopefully I'm doing a decent job. I want you all to be happy. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this, this next part of the story is something I want to talk about, which is something you've heard a lot about already, which is Albert's List. So Albert's List is something I founded in March of 2013. I was a really disengaged employee. I was contracting at Cisco, and it was, I think, March 3rd or 4th, 2013. And, you know, I was like, hey, uh, I get all these job opportunities every day, and I've been posting these to Facebook for the last couple of months. And people see this in between their Instagram food posts and they're probably getting annoyed. So I should start either a page or a group and I went with a group. And my initial interest in starting this group was really no more than to just dump job opportunities. I got a couple of jobs and a couple of gigs for other friends, but it really wasn't anything meant to be more than that. Uh, in fact, for the first, I think, year of this group, we only had 200 people. Now I add 200 people into this group on a weekly basis. Uh, and the, really the point of it is that what I discovered along the lines of building everything here was that when it comes to the job search, it's really all about people at the end of the day. I know that I work in marketing and I post things like Motivation Monday and Wisdom Wednesday and Feel Good Friday and all that fun stuff, but at the end of the day and really even here in this room today, it's like Albert's the fly. Uh, my goal is to inspire someone to continue with their job search, to feel like they have a chance in this really rough and tumble world. To feel like they have an opportunity to connect with somebody that they never connected before. Um, really in this story that's been always fascinating to me are the people who come to me who are like, I never thought I'd have a chance to work at Google. Um, not much less walk in through the doors at Google except for when my friend invites me for free lunch. And now I have like three, three interviews at Google on the self-driving car which, by the way, has been an available opportunity in my group in the past. And what I find really exhilarating is that it's the process of connecting people and the process of connecting people to opportunities that is really, really excitement-inducing. And that's important to me because there's a lot of resources out there. It's a really noisy world, and everyone wants a piece of your attention. And building job groups and building communities is cool with me because at least I can try to bring all of that attention into one spot. And at the end of the day, if someone even, maybe not even looking for a job, goes through my group on a daily basis and sees 20 or 30 posts from different recruiters, they're like, wow, you know, there is a job market out there. It is moving, and there are people to talk to. And so at the end of the day, there's like no excuse not to do anything. So job boards and communities, let's talk about how you maximize all of that. Because we're gonna make that a part of your job search strategy tonight. And so the first aspect that I think I want to get off of on this is that the usage of job search, uh, job boards, and communities requires you to be extremely social. I know that you know, in the day, today's day and age, despite the fact that we're all on Facebook and we're all on Twitter and we're all on LinkedIn, none of us want to actually talk to each other because we all want likes and shares and comments, but we're not actually interested in real conversation. But the prospect of using all these job boards and using all of these things requires real, actual conversation at the end of the day. So the po first point is that job boards do work. Uh, I actually got my current job off of monster.com based on a recruiter who reached out to me while I was finishing another interview. And they initially wanted me to move to St. Louis, and I said, you know what, I'll think about it, um, but sign me up for it anyway, and then they said I could stay in Orange County. 
And so job boards exist pretty much everywhere and it is your, it is your imperative to be on as many of them as possible because like we said at the very top, uh, you're gonna do things today that uh, push you forward in ways that you never imagined to get you the results that you want so that you can be where you wanna be, right? And so these are things like Indeed, Career Builder, Monster, ZipRecruiter, Craigslist, Simply Hired, your, uh, you know, your job board that's uh, at your alma mater, and everything in between that. And so as a job seeker on a daily basis, whether you're currently employed or you are fun employed, is to, go on one, is to go on all of these and have constant notifications coming in. It's the notion of abundance, it's the notion of inevitability, that you're going to get that job no matter what you do. And so, uh, no matter what, you know, it's, it's, it's putting up your resume, it's being as specific as possible, it's reaching out to recruiters who you might have never reached out to to have that conversation, and be assertive with your career and what you need to do. And then it's being proactive, right? So it's being about applying to those jobs while you are also being sought out. And this is how you get a ton of, a ton of interviews. Um, I know I haven't talked about my last job search, but uh, in total, I ended up having, I think, 128 interviews, of which turned, or 128 jobs that I applied to, of which turned into 83 interviews in total, uh, 28 of which, which were in person, and six of them which turned into offers. And that was all done within one month. And so the point of that is that you, know, you, have, to, you have to really put in a lot of work, be willing to be overwhelmed, and be willing to have your email just never see, never see the bottom of your email because there's just so much going on in your life. Uh, and so I guess that was really short, but yeah. Um, basically the point is uh, get on your get on your job search platform to make the most of it. And I think before the end of it, I also want to say if you do end up using something like an Albert's List, uh, it's important for you to also figure out how you can add value to the community as well. And so that exists in uh, trying to add value before you need to find a job. There are a lot of people in my group, for example, who aren't really looking for work right now, but they contribute to the group on a daily basis. They help people critique their resumes. They introduce themselves before they need a job. They tag their friends when it comes to they tag their friends when it comes to um, when it comes to job opportunities that their friends qualify for. They uh, contribute to uh, long form conversations like should I write a cover letter or uh, what should I do about this daily commute or am I committing career suicide? And the whole point of that is that when people know who you are online, similarly to your personal brand. When it comes to you looking to ask for what you want, people are more willing to come to uh, come to your come to your uh, your direction and your corner to see what they can do for you. Okay, so uh, this next section, we're going to talk about mastering the job interview. Uh, this is probably everyone's favorite part because uh, everyone is nervous as heck when they walk into an interview, and this is also the most important. Uh, so this uh, photo here is uh, my graduation day uh, back in 2010, and I was a poor, poor lost soul when I graduated. Who can relate? <laughs> Some of you. I guess maybe maybe all of you are better off than I am. Yeah. All right, whatever. <laughs> and unfortunately, despite the fact in the photo I look like I'm really self-assured, I really knew nothing about the world. Uh, I thought I was a pretty hotshot senior in college, and I thought I knew exactly what I was doing. And I ended up uh, going to my very first interview about six weeks before I graduated from college during winter quarter. It was for a IT analyst job at a well-known company here up the street. And I completely uh, messed up that interview <laughs> because I had no idea what I wanted to say. Uh, it was all about me. And I spent pretty much the majority of the interview asking questions like, what laptop am I gonna use? What salary am I gonna get? I know, you're all cringing, right? I cringe too now, it's ridiculous. But this was 20, 22 year old Albert and he, was, he had no idea what he was doing. I asked about the 401k package. I asked about paid time off. And I ended up asking for the guy's business card at the very end of the interview and he gave me an Indian rupee. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever because I didn't get a business card, I got currency. 
Somebody paid me for my time, apparently, even though one Indian rupee costs pretty much nothing. <laughs> and so I brought this rupee back to my friends, and I was like, yeah, you know, I got this Indian rupee, and it's like the coolest thing ever, and I probably got the job. And, and I never heard from any, from both, from, from the company ever again, until I contracted there a couple years later. You probably get who I'm talking about now. <laughs> and, and, and what I realized during that experience was, and it took me a couple of years to get here, was that the job is not about you, and it's most certainly not about the benefits of that job, even though 401k and healthcare and free gym and free food and all that stuff are things that we innately want because, hey, they're free or they're close to free, and they help us cut costs in a very expensive region. And that guy in that photo uh, was also two days away from really discovering the need that he also had to network and bring value to other people. Because the following Monday, while I started my new job, it was working from home, I, was wonder I wondered how I ended up there. And it was by way of that interview too. And I was freaking out on my alma mater's LinkedIn, wondering what do I do next? And in reality, I had no idea what I was doing next. Uh, and it's really just that journey from now to that, from then to now, which thankfully I've learned a thing or two. So don't be clueless like me. So the areas of mastering the job interview, they do lie in your ability to see your skills and uh, have that track record of what you've done in the past, but they really boil down to two things. It's self-awareness and it's potential. Self-awareness is your ability to understand who you are, where you are, what you are, and how you are to any company, as well as to your professional self. And your potential is what your company sees when they see you. Do they see somebody who's been maybe fired a few times? Or do they see somebody who knows a lot of the really cool, latest, hottest things on the market, and they want to take advantage of those skills so that they can take their company to the next level? And for both of these, it's important for you to sit in reflection with yourself because in self-awareness, it's knowing where you've been on your journey, how you've done on your journey, and what you're looking for next. I remember my first bit of self-awareness in my career uh, really came in December around last year where I had been working at this company for a while. I finally changed managers after the last manager and I had kind of had a falling out and I created New Year's resolutions. Granted, I didn't know I'd get laid off like two weeks later, but I made New Year's resolutions nonetheless because for the first time in my life, I felt like, okay, I'm working towards something. And regardless of whether you might get laid off next week, next year, or never, it's important for you to have that self-awareness of how you accomplish your goals from a year-to-year -year basis. And it's also up to you to understand your capability and your potential. And with regards to capability and potential, I know we all sell ourselves short. I sell myself short too, thinking that you know, applying for this job might be hard because I might have cognitive dissonance from other experiences of the past, or that you know, I'm not sure I can do this job. And the, really, really the thing at the end of the day is just to go for it and apply. Because what's the worst thing that can happen? You get a no, right? And you know, maybe you spend five minutes entering the same thing you've entered for the last 50 applications, but at the end of the day, it's still seeing how you fit within the market. Because the way I see it, uh, the way I see it, you're not only looking for that job, you're also seeing whether you fit in a specific level of years or whether you fit in a specific experience set or where you even fit in an industry. So self-assessment and value, I think, exists in two areas when it comes to the interview. The first one is how you, how you act situationally. So uh, for, those of, for those of you who might have interviewed a lot, there's something called the STAR method, which stands for situation, task, action, and result. And so this is the, how would I say it? This is the, uh, the, 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 the meat and potatoes of how you act in, within a company. So for example, in marketing, it's, it looks something like, tell me about a time where you helped execute a communications campaign for a particular product. And so using that situational assessment, you understand that you had a product to sell, which was your situation. The task you did was you created a social media strategy or you went out and you created a marketing campaign and you secured the budget. 
the action was that you put this strategy out to play, uh, you paid, you spent the money, and then at the end, the result was you sold a lot of that product, you made your boss look really good, and that's what you're gonna do for the new company you're gonna work for too. Uh, and so that's the situation. And you can apply that to any single industry because every single company you ever work for is gonna have something like that that happens. And the more you're able to set a conversation up like that, the better you're able to do <coughs> overall because that's the structure that your company is looking for. And not only is it the structure your company is looking for, that's the uh, skill set and the uh, level of capability that you have as well. The other aspect is what I like to call the cost versus revenue model. So this could either be comfortable or uncomfortable to most of you in the room, but as an employee for a company, you serve two purposes. Either you cost the company money or you make the company money. And what I mean by that is that uh, at the end of the day, um, businesses are here to stay in business and businesses are here to make a profit. And if they're not making a profit and they're not staying in business, they're either a hobby or they're defunct and bankrupt. And so, as an employee, it's important for you to understand where you fit within that model. Uh, whether you add to the bottom line or whether you strategically take away from the bottom line because there are actual needs within the business that either work in compliance or work in, uh, in areas where they need to count their dollars, things like that. And it's important for you also to understand how your strengths work within this role. So taking an example from my own career, as a marketing manager, I am a person who works closely and directly with sales without being sales. And so when I go into an interview, I understand that I add value to the bottom line because I create the necessary sales collateral, I create the necessary blog, blog posts that drive thought leadership, I work with our sales team to drive sales enablement, and I come up with a lot of long form content that drives email downloads. And my strengths lie in writing, expression, and being able to come up with the right marketing strategies that ultimately make a company better. And so, your mileage may vary on your role, but at the end of the day, you're either costing your company money or you're making your company money. And so it's important for you to understand where you fit within that model, and then from that model, figure out your strengths, and then move from there. So, conquering interviewing questions is the next section because that, I think, coupled in addition to these two aspects, are what really, really drive, uh, what really drive um, interview success. So interview questions all wanna know, interviewers who ask you questions within an interview all wanna know, how do you fit within any particular role? And they're gonna ask you behavioral questions such as, uh, tell me about a time when you did these following things. And you're gonna have to be able to answer in the STAR method. They're gonna also ask you situational questions, which are also star method questions, such as, tell me a time when you successfully did these following things. Tell me about a time when you weren't able to work closely with a colleague, things like that. And it's your, it's your, it's your imperative to create the appropriate stories that help drive the interviewer to trust you and understand where you fit in with everything. And then finally, it's confidence and nervousness. So we all know that going on an interview is like going on a date, where you feel like you're being put out to pasture and you're being indicted for who you are. And yeah, it stinks, but if you know how to play the game, where you're able to answer these kind of questions as well as your behavioral and situational, it makes the whole entire process a whole lot easier. And so the most important thing at the end of the interview and when it goes into, goes into a job interview is that it's not about you. It's not about the benefits you're gonna get, that 401k plan, the shiny laptop, which by the way was a MacBook Pro, I think, for that job. <laughs> I can't tell you anything else, but I know they were gonna give me a MacBook. And it's, it's, it's not about the salary, even though at the end it might be a little bit when you're negotiating. It's about the value you're adding to the company at the end of the day. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and put it all together here. And this is the final story that I have. And this story is about my job interview from February, uh, from January, February of this year. And I, I came into this last interview, into this last job search, like other job searches, not expecting to be laid off. 
uh, because I was actually doing better than I was in my other previous layoffs where I either had no idea what I was doing, I wasn't present, or me and my money boss just hated each other's guts and didn't want to do anything about it except fire me. Uh, and so I went into this job search with a different sense of what I wanted to do because I think for the first time in this job search, I had put all of these slides that you see behind me all together into one. Uh, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew how to somewhat look for it. I knew how to network my way to it as well. And I was relentless. Uh, what I understood in this particular journey at that time was that because I was also new to Orange County, I didn't know as many people. I knew a lot of people up here in the Bay Area, thankfully. Lots of different staffing agencies. Lots of friends who were willing to put in good words for me. But what wasn't really as prevalent was the fact, like, how would I get a job in Southern California? I had never done it before. I had no idea what to do. And so really, I just set out to see what could happen. And you know, I had to do what I hadn't, I had to do things I hadn't done before to get to places where I hadn't been to get the results that I wanted. And so ultimately, I ended up with the stats that I mentioned to you earlier, where it was 128, inter 128 job applications, 85 interviews, 28 in person, and ultimately six offers. And so that's the same kind of relentlessness and pursuit that I want each and every one of you in this room to look at when you look at your job search at the end of the day. Because you're worth more than you think you're worth, and you're also, uh, you're also more skilled than you think you are. And the jobs that are out there for you are gonna show up and give you what you need in order to move forward. So the final really ask, the final the final couple of slides here are checklists. It's create the vision you want for your career, focus, uh, build a personal brand like we said earlier, which is figuring out what you stand for, what you believe in, what you're committed to. And then it's to go out and network, find the relevant events that you need, deliver the value that you're hunting for, get on those job boards and communities, and then to prepare for the job interview. And you know from there it's. Pretty much, um, pretty, it's pretty much uh, smooth sailing. So the final thing I want to leave you guys with tonight is this gift of the three themes that I think you need in order to successfully uh, conquer a job search. And I know we didn't get to the negotiation process. That's a completely different story. Uh, you get an offer, you take that offer, or you just go ahead and decide that you're worth more, and you go ahead and negotiate and see if a company will move. But the three gifts that I want to leave with you tonight are mindset, resilience, and execution. Uh, I think those are the biggest, three biggest themes that we've had in tonight's presentation. Mindset is your uh, setting, setting, the strong, setting the strong and big intentions that you have for moving forward in your job search. Resilience is your ability to go ahead and attend those networking events and be relentless at those networking events and interviews as well as uh, networking conversations. And finally, your execution, where you're willing to go into places that you've never done, to execute and accomplish what you've never done before, to get to a place that you want to be at. And so, with these three combined together, uh, you can have a successful job search as any. And you know, throwing the whole kitchen sink at your job search uh, in this way will get you to the results that you're hunting. So with that, I think we have a couple minutes left, and okay. I can take some questions. Here's what, I gotta do a couple of housekeeping things. Thank you, Albert. Can you give him a round of applause? <laughs> I learned a lot today. I learned a lot today.